um, Marcus, uh, overview. Yes, okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of council. I have uh, one quick introduction and uh, two very brief updates. I would like to first introduce you to Michael Wasserberg, who's our new director of the Office in Homelessness. Uh, Michael has over 20 years of experience. Uh, he comes to us uh, most recently from uh, Chicago, the um, public action to deliver shelter in uh, Illinois. I'm sorry. And it's uh, great to have him here. As a matter of fact, you will recall that uh, Sarah Page Fuller, uh, who was in that position, who is now in the CSB, uh, made this uh, possible, and we're very excited to have Michael with us. So thanks, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I, I actually, uh, the, the, the vice mayor just mentioned to me that I've never made a formal introduction of our human services, excuse me, human resources director, uh, Capri Stanley, who's with us, who's been with us. Please stand up, Capri. Who's been with us uh, for a while and has been doing some great things. So uh, forgive me, Capri, for not making that introduction. And uh, very briefly, before I turn it back over to you, Mayor and Council, um, we have some good news from Lori Crouch, and then Ron wants, Ron will give us a brief update on food trucks in the lottery that was last week. Okay. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the national awards that Norfolk has won within really the last week or and a half. Um, I think the manager briefed you the last time we were together about the Bronze Telly Award. Um, last, not last week, a week and a half ago, before we went to Denver, um, we won an award for Meet, Greet, and Imagine. Um, Public Relations Society of America recognized our efforts for a community relations campaign um, less than $3,499. That's what it says on the Great Blue Site Award in my um, uh, uh, office. Um, but they, we were noted by judges out in Arizona for our efforts to do, really they were just impressed with the fact that we were able to gather a large group of the community together in a very creative, innovative way um, and not spend a lot of money to do it. Uh, so we were recognized nationally by Public Relations Society of America. And then, of course, I, I was shamelessly emailing you all in Denver uh, last Sunday night. Uh, Norfolk won the All-America City Award um, 2013. We traveled with a delegation of 10 um, folks on our team, uh, residents, um, staff, and the manager did a great job as our narrator. And if you haven't seen the video, it's on our Facebook page. We put together a 10-minute presentation um, and then took about 10 minutes of questions from the judges. Our focus this year was on our military initiatives, our flooding strategies, and our Neighbors Building Neighborhoods program. Um, and it was just really great. The residents hit a home run for us. Not only could, not only were they just great in the presentation, um, they stepped up to the microphone to answer the judges' questions. These folks are highly engaged in our community, highly engaged in what the city is doing, and they expressed um, what our our partnership so great. I really think with, I mean, they just did a great job. They they, they brought us over the edge. And it was exciting when we were talking to the judges afterwards. Um, you know, they said everyone in that room wanted to hear Norfolk. The room was packed. You could go and watch everyone's presentations. Our presentation was packed, um, not a seat empty in the house. And the judges said afterwards they were just really impressed. And the head judge said, you know, we had about seven more questions we wanted to ask you, but they could only ask us three in the time frame. So it made us all feel good that we are really leading the way when it comes to veterans, to flooding, to uh, civic engagement right here in Norfolk. And, and it was just an exciting time. So we are shamelessly plugging this now. <laughs> um, it's on all of our email signatures and we're going to be putting things on our vehicles and we're just working with Bob and his team. We're, we're coming up with ways to just continue to share this with the city and the community. The Neighbors Building Neighborhoods Committee is planning an event for the city to celebrate as well. So. Is there anyone who can put it up on the interstates as you come into the city? <laughs> we are working on signage. We talked about signage. Um, we had it. Wayne Shank was awesome with the airport. I called him in Denver <coughs> or in Chicago on my way back and I said, Wayne, me, the manager at the airport, and I on the marquees put it up, and it was there when we got off the plane a couple hours later. Um, it's been up on the seven venues digital board, <coughs> on the Nautilus board. I mean, we, we were making phone calls and emailing people at midnight on Sunday, I think, for Denver. So it's been, uh, it's been great fun. 
Oh, I'm so excited. Well, and poor Marcus, I think, lost circulation in his hair because we were just sitting there listening the way she announced it. I was like, oh. So, thank you. Well, Laurie, nice going, and everybody who took part in it, um, uh, despite the sort of modest support you got from the council, um, which might be an overstatement, I, I really uh, think you guys pushed ahead and um, made us all very proud. So thank you for that. Thank you, Marcus. Everybody got involved in it. Okay, um, Andy, anything? Uh, two things. Uh, Marcus, uh, we have been discussing whether or not we were open July 5th. There are a lot of places that are closed July 5th. And Marcus, I don't know if you made a decision on that. Or are you considering it? At this point, we have remained open you know, but Just to let you know, I know our bit, we're closing on the 5th in our office. I don't know uh, what others are doing. But, uh, have you checked around with other cities if they're open? I believe Portsmouth is contemplating closing, and Newport News and Hampton are closed. So you may want to think about it, other jurisdictions are doing that. Um, just a thought. Uh, there's some discussion about uh, the. It's end of June, and I think my 365 pass is up. Uh, how's that working for city employees, including us? Sure. The a um, <clears throat> couple things. And step in if I, if I mess this up. We, uh, last year, the, the goal was to have light rail free. Um, because it's difficult to figure out whether or not a ride begins with light rail or begins on the bus, what occurred is that we had the, the go pass, which had both light rail and the bus service free. Um, when HRT started to renegotiate these deals, it cost a, a lot more. So what we did was we locked into those individuals who we knew rode the bus. And I believe that was close to 600 individuals. So we wanted to make sure that we um, provide an opportunity for them to continue utilizing both the light rail and the bus service. So the light rail, I'm not supposed to say free. The, there is no cost for the rider to ride light rail next year. We're dealing with that from the city's perspective. So all employees- Beginning July 1. Beginning July 1 will continue to be able to, to ride light rail um, at no expense to them. But we are having, I think, in the neighborhood about 600 go passes that will be available to those individuals who depended upon more than just light rail at a deep, deep discount. <coughs> I was gonna, just if I could follow up. Um, it's, does Norfolk PD understand that we don't need the 365 pass? Or can we at least explain to them that all we need to do is show a city ID and not getting sure, a ticket? Let me make sure that's what's going to happen July 1st. Is July 1st is the same thing we just show an ID? Yes. Yeah, so okay, they're so familiar with it. We're good. Okay. All right. All right. Question. Thank you. That's what I, I need to know. just want to piggyback. If, if, if I could just well, we can go ahead and piggyback that. I want to. Yeah, I just want to ask you. you we're paying for these passes, even though you said free, but there's a cost associated with each employee that receives that benefit. You buy a number of light rail passes, so if you got, I don't know if you give 7,000 out, I mean, is there? Right, so the, so the light rail, <clears throat> we are absorbing the cost associated with light rail. So in other words, light rail is going to run, and it's going to be the fare box, and it's going to be revenue outside the fare box. So we pay. We, yes, we got a number. We we have we have a number. Yes, and we, we said we're X number of employees. We're going to give uh, buy X number of tickets for light rail, and this is what we're going to pay for. Well, for light rail, um, so we, we let's divide it up. For light rail, we're going to have the same system as last year, where it's no expense to ride the light rail. Now, if somebody wants to go pass. Which right. means they're going to get on a, get on a bus, I'm and there sure is some cost to that. But but uh, but at the end of the day, are we still? You say there's no light cost rail. to light rail. Right. Right. We we pay all the expenses of the light rail, so it doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any difference. Charge. There. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. okay. I was just and trying they changed to... the go pass because uh, we would we they put that in motion, Mr. Shuket, to get people riding and get them used to riding, and, and put it financially they needed to. Change the. I don't know if we because city of Norfolk makes That made a difference. You got some employees to have them that don't use them. So right. But it yeah. makes sense to 
to to streamline your departments and say, look, you know, you you, you got individuals that don't use rail, them. Though. Well, that's what I was trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah. It don't make a difference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But your point is, Bill, for, for the go pass, as we did just then, why would we purchase 4,000 go pass if only 600 people are using them? So that's where we start. We stuck with utilization. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, also, I think that council needs to know, uh, just as a point of information, uh, I'm chair uh, through being on council of the Hamburg Regional Jail, uh, and uh, being chair, just to give you a quick update as to where we are, um, we've met uh, last week at our quarterly meeting. Uh, in 2002, we began taking immigration inmates in. Those immigration inmates total, and I'm going to give you a ballpark, most recently around 400 and some inmates. Uh, we are now down to zero, uh, and it's the first time that we've been at zero since 2002. Uh, there's various reasons we think as to why that may have occurred. Uh, nothing that the jail has done. There's been a new facility opened outside of Farmville with federal money. Uh, there's the Rappahannock Jail, which is closer to D.C., which they may have transferred inmates to. Uh, we are uh, have set up a meeting, we're trying to set up a meeting through uh, Sheriff Roberts in Hampton to find out why we are in this position of zero. Why is that significant to us? Well, keeping in mind that for every federal inmate that's there, the feds pay that freight. Um, that being said, we have 400 bed spaces that we would have to consider uh, through the jurisdiction over it. We do have money in savings, uh, but at some point that may be an issue that we have to deal with as a municipality and it could affect our bottom lines. So you need to understand that that's something that we may have to deal with in the next six to six months, 12 months. Uh, we hope and we've heard that uh, it's possible that these inmates will come back. We heard it was an issue of sequestration, but it is could have some impact as to our budget when it comes to that. So to give you that little bit of a forewarning, we're trying to figure out why. Uh, we think we know what it is, nothing that we did wrong, but uh, uh, it is something that could affect us. Now, of course, you have Portsmouth. Um, we don't know where their council will be um, at some point in the future, whether or not they will build their own jail, whether they'll attach to the regional jail. Of all the ironies in the world, we're down 400 inmates. That's about how many they have in their city jail, you know, if they were looking to redevelop their property. So we don't know where they're going to be. Portsmouth is always a discussion when it comes to that. But I think that it's something that all of you need to know about, so that way, six months, 12 months down the road, that we're not caught by surprise if the per diem of our own inmates are affected. So that's and what's our occupancy? You know, I couldn't tell you off. I, I, you know, I can't, I don't remember. I had that, Terry. I think we have 250. Um, yeah, we, I think we do 250 in Norfolk. Can we fill it? Um, I'm trying to remember back. It's got to be close to 1,000 right now. Um, so there's 1,000 beds, beds in the regional jail? And I'm, a, I'm just giving you the ballpark, About. but we're short 400 right now, meaning 400 mean people are gone. Empty. So 400 are empty? Yeah. And what about our jail? I mean, we always hear about um, over-occupancy. Is that an option for us? I don't us think or? that's an issue right now. Yeah, I think that you're going to no, find that goes up that's down, another Terry, issue, Terry, is that's a good question. Saying. Inmate populations around the state are down. Um, and uh, so... It is something that we may have to look at in the future, so what we do could affect the per diem, and Marcus is, has been familiar with it. We've talked about it before. Now, um, uh, our jail has an a occupancy. It was built for 1350 I believe, something like that. And I, and I was in there every day about sixteen. I thought one time it was 1900 uh, Yeah, I, I think they, they do two things. One, there's this um, occupancy, and I think it's something like 900 but then you can... <clears throat> double bunk so many beds, and, and you're right. I think that uh, it's, it's much more than the 900. Um, at the um, the height, maybe back in 2006, they were close to 1900 mm -hmm. in there, and I think that they've been closer to that that 1500 number that you you just said. Yeah, as far as having served on the regional jail board uh, and its chairman in the past, that uh, those uh, vice inmates. Uh, you know, you're right. Ice inmates, um, it helped them with they, what they call a rate stabilization mm -hmm. fund. They put that money in their savings and something went awry. But I would imagine that um, when they, if they bring those uh, those uh, immigrants, uh, inmates back, 
the localities are going to be fighting for that because at one time McCain was fighting to get you know some of those because it's it's, it's good money. You know? Well, you know, that and I think that they're not from the sheriffs that were there. Um, that wasn't an issue. I, I will say that there was even a discussion. It came out at the meeting as to whether or not they should try to get federal inmates, mm -hmm. meaning marshals inmates, uh, that were under local charges. But that really is something that won't happen because our local jails uh, do receive some mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, all those numbers are down. Uh, well, that's good. I think the jail so. has 1,465 people go. today. 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 So I'm sorry right. to express my ignorance. No, that's who right. goes, who typically is sent to the regional jail? The sickest they, of the sick. Right. So is it the long term? Or no, the, people that are, that it, it ser almost spiral. serves as a hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, those those inmates who are, are very ill or need, you know, medical treatment, they're the ones that localities send to the uh, region. What about jail. mental illness? I'm not sure about that. Mental but don't they have a larger female population, too, because they have to be segregated? Uh, and they have a birthing, they have a birthing facility or something, they have too, don't they? They have the ability to, to for pregnant inmates. Yeah, it's a well. hospital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the... If you look at the, the pods as you walk in, one of the pods is basically a hospital pod. Uh, it's, it is like being in a hospital facility. Um, I mean, it's, uh, they even have um, dialysis uh, that goes on within the facility itself, which is uh, instead of putting, and they do, and I would, the day, one of the days I was there, we had, the dialysis was running, you had, you had people in the chair and another one waiting to go. Several communities went into this uh, arrangement years ago because the state agreed to pay a higher percentage, I think, of the construction costs if you could get regional facilities built. And um, it was, I mean, it was good for us for a long time, and maybe someday it will be good again, but it's, I think we have some excess beds now. But it's as a heads up, it could affect us in some way. <coughs> All right, thank you. Mr. Riddick, anything? Else? Yeah, I've got a few things. Uh, number one, this is in Mr. Burford's ward. Marn Avenue from Lafayette Boulevard to Pershing has to be the worst street in the city and all. And it's just, it's just unreal. I go to a dry cleaners in that area. And it's just unreal and I know that, that this street has been neglected. I mean, it just looks, you're talking about potholes. It just looks awful. You're talking about behind the cleaners of Lafayette? Actually, when you go in, it's a, it's a, it's a restaurant on the corner. It's a fast food restaurant. Uh, managed burgers, managed or burgers or something like that. Mm -hmm. That part of my Martin mm -hmm. from Lafayette to Pershing is no excuse for it to look like that. We went out there, took James, and we took Public Works, mm -hmm. and took everybody out there. And uh, uh, James, James, right here, he's behind you. James, you know we went out there. Yes. That's the street we were we were yeah. working on. Um, so you might want to get an update to Mr. Riddick yes, as it relates to that. Yeah. But we've been. Uh, Trying, we've been dealing with some other issues, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to deal with the the element, the yeah. social issues as, as well. So yeah. we uh, maybe that might make them feel better. The yeah, residents, yeah, you know, it is, it, looks. yeah. We we have been uh, so we it is on the radar. Yeah, uh, and I've been talking to uh, Mr. Kuyper about Johnson Avenue. That's in pretty bad shape from Proja up to Church Street. Um, you know, we a few months ago, we were talking about the gun violence that we're having, you know, around here. And it looks like it's going from, you know, one city to another. And and I'm wondering at what point uh, does the FBI come in uh, and, and look at the entire region and find out where these guns are coming from? I was talking to a young fellow the other day and he said from 13 years old, these kids got guns, you know. And I was wondering if one of the things, you know, uh, a few years ago, we changed our requirements to of, uh, having to get a gun permit through the city of Norfolk and just let the state and federal, you know, uh, look at the person's background to determine. And I'm wondering if we put ours back in the place where we made it a requirement to come through the city to have a um, gun permit as opposed to letting the federal uh, background check be the only evaluation, would that do anything to slow it down? That's something that I guess we can talk about, or Marcus, you can give us an idea on that. And the other thing, the final thing is, 
Last week I asked uh, Mr. Pishko the process of uh, uh, impaneling uh, a grand jury. You know, we had this shooting at Wells Fargo, and it's in the Commonwealth Attorney's uh, hands, and we don't know anything about it. <clears throat> Commonwealth Attorney's office is a political office. It's tied to the city, and um, I just don't feel comfortable with what the results might be, and we still won't know anything. And so, you know, and, and I understand that the only person who can impanel the, is the uh, circuit court judge or uh, the attorney general. And I'm, I would imagine the circuit court judge would have to determine whether they, there was some value in it. But I'm just wanting to, to say that I just don't have the confidence that I, I should have uh, in what the results might be. We know nothing about it. And so I just want to put that on the record. Well, the, the prosecutor can go any other Wednesday and go to the grand jury. There's a difference in the type of grand jury that you're talking about, that, an investigative type grand jury. That's, that's not what you would have here. This is... And he, and he's doing his due diligence investing. <coughs> he's trying to reach his... A, a, <coughs> he will tell us whether he thinks the force was justified or not. Mm -hmm. Whether, and then... Um, then beyond that, then he'll, if he decides that it that um, it's not justified, then he has a full range of options. Yeah, I think that, he, but he doesn't. And I think what and Paul is correct in a certain instance. However, <clears throat> grand juries normally sit in Norfolk. It's like every other Wednesday, and the the, the Commonwealth <coughs> attorney can once they have prepared their case and they're they can take it to the grand jury, mm -hmm. and that grand jury is sitting and hears any of those cases, those felony cases that comes through. It's there. That grand jury is sitting, and it, then it's the next one two weeks later. So he's not going to impanel anything special at this point. Um, it's any crime, and this would be considered a, any crime that he can take it before them. And I understand where you're coming from, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, uh, I can see where especially the issues we've had recently at council, how that comes out. I think at this point, you know, grand juries do sit in secret. Uh, sometimes true bills come out, sometimes they don't come out. Uh, and who knows what the Commonwealth attorney will do in this case. He may decide to take it to the grand jury, not say anything, come out with a true bill, and the next thing you know, you have a case that is charged. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that he gives it to the citizens that way. I think right now, and I've thought about this, uh, is that we have to at least let the process move on, let them get, you know, the, the police have given their evidence over. I think he asked for more forensics, uh, if I'm correct, uh, and see, uh, perhaps you know, he will decide at that point in the process whether or not he takes it over and, and asks for an indictment or not. But I don't think he needs to do it. And, he, and, and there is certain precedent in the past. I remember Jack Doyle, when he was Commonwealth Attorney, Jack had um, taken a case to grand jury. Uh, right. And it wasn't a special grand jury. I think he just yeah. took it to the regular and panel and, grand jury. And, um, and they came back, no true bill. Exactly. And, but I don't think you announce it ahead of time um, because then you may be tainting your grand jury. It may be best to, at this point, we're this far along in the procedure, to find out where, where the Commonwealth attorney takes it. He's got some, and he's got some very good lawyers over there, and I think that we just got to hope that the political process doesn't come into play and that we, justice really does come out. Uh, but you've got a great point, great point on that. So I think we got okay. a little bit of time. Right. This that's is where he goes. Okay. A couple things. Uh, I'd like to get uh, an update. I know there's a lot going on. We're disbanding the Hamroach Partnership, and there's a group of business people. Hamroach Partnership, by the way, is solved. Right. I mean, as of next week, I think it's going to be gone. But where? So if you get a, a fee, <laughs> somebody wants you to right. pay it. To, membership don't pay it. I know we have a group of business, business people working to try to make it all working together more effective and <clears throat> can we get an update on how they what where we're headed or, or is it too early to, to uh, you know I know they disbanded that and you know they got the we got the economic <coughs> Ambrose Economic Development Committee which may or may not be effective. I'd like to take a look and, uh, but I don't want to get in the way of if this is some master plan that we're all all the cities are working together. I don't, Barclay, I don't think there's a 
a master plan at all. I I think there was a sense that the Hampton Roads partnership had sort of lived, and you know, it's um, I mean, it sort of run its course. Right. Uh, what people hoped that you know that like the head of uh, Newper New Ship and Colonial Williamsburg and Norfolk Southern and those Centera, those people would come to meetings every day, every week. They stopped coming. Uh, the you know the head of William Mary and DVMS, all those people stopped coming. So, I mean, there was a sense that uh, that uh, somebody else could maybe come up with a, with a better there's strategy. No, there's no end game for that. No, there. No, that's. I mean, it, it's dissolved. In fact, we a lot of the mayors have all have with, resigned from the board, which had happened in order for the bylaws. I mean, for the corporation to to come up well. This group of businessmen is completely out there by them by themselves doing, I mean, they're not affiliated with, with any of the, the cities. There's no city membership, there's no city dues, there's nothing, no city anything. Okay, I, well, I didn't want to, something, no. but I, based on that, I would like to look into the Ham Road's economic development, and how we fit into that, and whether it is, in fact, benefiting us, and whether our money is well spent, and I know that, you know, I'd like to look at some results, and, and, and analyze it, uh, and also, uh, you know, we talked during the budget about indexing real estate tax, and maybe at the retreat we could have spend a little time in the pros and cons of whether or not we index that. Um, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, all right, the, the third thing is a couple of senior citizens have asked me about that. This is really an answering question of whether we could structure so that they could pay monthly their taxes. So that, I got, so I, uh, that, uh, I'm going to speak to that when we I talk about the senior. Right. Since and we I got senior quarterly with relief. a big number and not have any penalty on them. I mean, you know, start working on that. Yeah. Right. And I think the they're on tight budgets and, and when you get a big number, throws them off. Um, I guess that's all I'll leave. That's all I've got. Um, I mentioned when we had the nice report on Nauticus and uh, the cruise terminal that I'd like to a report done on what actually the finances are of the cruise terminal. Uh, I thought that the report was great, but it certainly didn't have the detail that I think we deserve. And I'd like, again, to ask that that be brought to council. Secondly, I've talked to the city manager and Andy and a few of you others, I think, have been approached. Um, many of you are perhaps aware of this movement for what's called Ban the Box, and that is a movement to remove a box that is on the initial application uh, saying whether or not an applicant has had a felony. I think we all know that many of our uh, citizens and a, and a vast predominance of those are African American have had felonies that were relatively small. Um, uh, events uh, perhaps a long time ago but the box often immediately removes them con from consideration for the job. This does not mean that you wouldn't still acquire that, uh, that an applicant has a felony. Um, that certainly would be part of the job um, application and, and that process but it would keep um, applicants from being initially um, removed from that consideration. And I've talked with Marcus, and apparently we have the box, but we don't necessarily use it for uh, whether or not we decide to further the applicant. So my thought was that if we don't use it, I'm not sure why we have it. So I, I'd really like council to consider this as a city. Um, I, I really think it's a, it would be very helpful for us. And then lastly, by the way, I've mentioned that in here about three times, banning the box yeah. in here. On a, over, and I think in a lot time. of places that yeah. have done that, the only time it comes into play is it's a public safety sure. job. Yeah, and like I said, it, at no point would that not be part of the interview to know right. about those felonies, but it would allow somebody that has some skills and talents to get through well, that. An initial history. review, if somebody's checked the felony box, they normally don't get interviewed. Right. Yeah. And if you take that box away and then they get interviewed, and during the interview process you can ask them, they will tell me about it. Well, you know, you know, if it's a nonviolent offense, if it was something, yeah. you know, 
Right. And I'm all for that, Terry. I okay. think it helps people. It's a second and then, chance. Lastly, I, we're, of course, I'm not pointing any names, but Anthony and Paul were supposed to <laughs> look at um, our task force and our committee <laughs> process, I believe in September of 2012. <laughs> um, I. I know I've missed a couple of meetings, and more so. More speed. <laughs> but anyway, more importantly, we, I'm not sure what's happened to our committee structure. I mean, I haven't had a committee meeting in a very long time, and I know Christine was also going to be looking at that. Um, but I'd like to know, as a, I think, as a council, we need to discuss what our structure is going to be, what our our procedure will be for bringing things um, to agenda and what we as a council decide is important and we want to pursue. Um, and if we're, it's not going to be through the committee, then we need to know some way that um, this legislation, let's, legislative process can be uh, facilitated. So I don't know how you how all want to do that. How we do our business is really important, not only for what we do, but would it be okay if we, if we talked about it at the retreat? Would that be... So it, does this mean we'd have no more committee meetings until September? Well, actually, we sort of, I mean, kind of we, done we had, we no, sort of yeah, done the last one anyhow. Yeah, we July, we would have one. Well, I, I was, what we did was, I thought we all decided. Uh, what was the retreat date? Yeah, I thought yeah, in the end what happened was we were kind of all going to be there. We were all going to be. Right. right yeah. But we haven't had a meeting. I was going to, I was going to bring it up too. What I was going to suggest, like today, our committee meeting got canceled. But if the four original committee members still wanted to get together and use that time to develop um, possible presentations, we should at least have that opportunity, I guess, to use that time to discuss things. It doesn't have to be the full council, but we still kind of have the four originals, and then we open it up to everybody. Could, could we discuss this next week? How about that? So we can all, you know, instead of, because it's, it's nearly six, but we can... Yeah. We'll get that on the agenda for next right, so, week. And next then week next week we're doing appointments? Yes. Or yes. Appointments? Yes. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. And we'll do committee structure then, too. Okay. A couple of things. <clears throat> the, um, the, the Talking about light rail, uh, the trains are, are, are pretty clean. They're real, uh, truly maintained well, but the shelters are not. Uh, I was at that shelter today, the one in Monticello. And they really need to have someone power washing and cleaning uh, those areas. I mean, that, that makes a, uh, that's one of our more prominent stops there in terms of people going to Scope Chrysler Hall or what have you. And uh, it just doesn't speak well for us, as I said, getting off the train today, looking at the, uh, the surface and then the, the uh, covered area shelter itself. So they really need to have someone come out there late in the evening and, you know, uh, clean those on a daily basis, or at least every uh, uh, two days or so. Um, you know, I, I know we're going to have this conversation today, but in, in wearing two hats, uh, uh, it, uh, one of my, well, a couple of my constituents called me as it relates to the process uh, uh, that, that has taken place with the uh, senior tax relief. I got, you know, a young lady, 85 years old, her and her husband, he's 89, she's 85. They've been on this program uh, for quite some time. And, you know, and I don't know who they're dealing with over there, but this is not a welfare program. And so uh, we should treat this program with the dignity that it so deserves and treat our citizens with the dignity that they so deserve. And then oftentimes when you're dealing with senior citizens, you know, up in age, uh, um, I think we need to be very sensitive in our efforts in dealing with them. Someone brings in an application and they tell you drop it in the box, and then you call them and tell them that, uh, or uh, or send them back the application and, and highlight in areas and say they didn't fill that out. It should have been reviewed if they took the time to go into the um, the place where they're accepting the applications. They should have taken the time to review to make sure that the person filled out everything. In this particular case here, she they sent the application back to her on the 4th. Uh, she reviewed it, made the, uh, filled out the areas uh, that uh, she needed to fill out, put it back in the mail that very day. She called me. Uh, 
She made a copy at the at the place where she was there, gave her a copy of, of the, app, the application back, and she let them keep the one they told her, put it in a box, didn't have time to talk to her. On, on the 6th, she received a letter. Now, the, the program, uh, you had to have everything in by June 1st. The program, again, she received a letter back, uh, I mean, on the 6th, saying that because she didn't acquiesce in, 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 uh, in the, uh, the allotted time, that she would be denied uh, senior tax relief uh, this year. Uh, that is unacceptable. I mean, the mere fact that we are going to a deferral system is one thing. And the mere fact that we, 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 uh, uh, we did some other things, we tweaked the program in some other ways. But no one be, should be disenfranchised by this program if they submitted their, their, their application uh, in the time that we've asked them to do so. And especially if they're walking into these, these the various places. And I've met with you, Sabrina, and the gentleman, about other situations uh, uh, like this. And I just think that, you know, because we're moving to a, a, a new system uh, that's challenging in itself, and because we have limited uh, uh, dollars, uh, I still think that we have a fiduciary responsibility to our citizens to make sure that we give them the best service, best information in terms of uh, 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 trying to qualify for the program. Because we can't have what we had last year where we had over 100 folk who uh, missed out and, sure. uh, and and I thank you for, you know, for working with them to be able to get uh, uh, these, uh, about 80 some of these individuals back into the program. Uh, so I'm, I'm really concerned. And, and like Barkley said earlier, we've, uh, I know that we're going to have uh, an abundance of seniors who are getting, uh, the persons that are getting 100% will be fine. But they won't know until, I think, the second week of July uh, what they qualify for. So what we started doing in office, and I had to check state code to make sure we can do this. Uh, but what we're doing is setting up Barkley a payment plan that we're doing it manually. I got the, the we got it in our system to do a flag and we send a bill and it allowed people 10 months to be able to pay uh, if they have $200 a quarter, $800, they can pay that monthly with no uh, right. P&I, no P&I uh, and uh, to help some of these uh, uh, seniors out. Uh, so we're going to start doing that. So I'm, we're doing, uh, we're going to have two meetings in July and two meetings in August around the city uh, targeting uh, senior citizens uh, so we can roll out this program to, to help these uh, seniors who can't pay uh, the full amount each quarter. So uh, they don't, seniors sometimes don't get, get the word or are not able to get out. <laughs> Are you gonna? We gonna send them something with their first bill and say? Well, that, that's what we. That's why we're trying to get out and, and, and see as many of them as we possibly can. I'm gonna get with Bob Batcher and his staff to reach out. Uh, get with uh, the. That uh, gonna be anybody over 65. Well, they they know what they qualify for. If a person is 100 percent, they're fine. But if they're not 100 percent, 80 percent, 60 percent, 50 percent. Well, these people. Uh, hopefully, we could we could get to them and let them know what, where the meeting is going to be. Then I got a date of, of we, June fifth. I mean, just because they're not in the program, there's still some people <coughs> that are on tight. Well, they I mean, well they we, they'll be they'll be to come in. But as long as I'm able, like I said, we can work with them as long <coughs> as we can put them on ten months. As long as we have every dime in by June fifth, we're good. Well, and so, or if they need to start. Paying in July, really, if we pay back, right? If they, if, well, if you got a person who knows now, July 1, they could, we could work with them and do 12 months. But most people in the program will know the second week of July, bills that goes out September, so we're going to put them on for what 10 I'm months. Saying, anybody, are you saying just people that were or have been in the program, are you saying anyone who's a senior citizen over 65 can opt into this payment program? No, but I'm, what I don't want to be that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that would be a, a different question if right. you're asking it to set up um, a, a differential well, treatment. I mean, there's somebody. Somebody on the line. I, I, if, a per, but, if a person came in, Barkley, if a person came in and they had a difficult time paying their tax, we can work with them. 
But I'm not, I, what we've tried to do is open it up to these scenes because this is a new program. And I've seen already an abundance of individuals who will who qualify for 100 percent in the past, who probably won't qualify for 100 percent now, who will need some type of help. So what we're saying is when we roll this out, if a person that comes in and they got a hardship, not that they just don't want to pay it all, but if they got a hardship and they need help, okay, and they were directed. So anybody who's a senior could do that, whether they were in the program or now out. Right. That's what I'm saying. I think you ought to make that. But not everybody. You probably, there are people that are just above and never been in it. Yeah. Might as well reach out to them also. Well, uh, we'll do that, right? Yeah. Okay. That's all I have to right. uh, Angela? Um, I, I uh, appreciate what the church office is doing with regard to senior citizen tax relief. I just want to renew my objection for the record to the whole change in the plan of senior citizen tax relief. I think it was a bad idea then, and I think it's a bad idea now. Um, as for July 5th, I do favor July 5th, letting our employees um, take that day off. Um, July 4th is a Thursday. They'll be off. A lot of people are taking probably July 5th off anyway. So it'll probably be a skeleton crew here. So why make the skeletons work? So we should just go ahead and give them that day off. I, I think it would be good for them. It would be good for them to spend some time with their families. And it would be a good gesture for the city to do that. Um, the last. I should not let my employees know. How much does it cost the city without that? Marcus said it was a minimal cost to the city for us to let them off on July 5th. So. I, I don't know what minimal means. I mean, I've got office appointments here on Friday. I mean, I'm I'm working uh, in, yeah, in my office. Yeah, the key to the city. I don't have the key to the city. I, it, that's that's. I mean, I. Yeah, anyway. Um and uh, two additions that um, we're recommending for poverty commission uh, resumes. I'm handing out so you guys can add it to your. Um, commission books for next week. It's uh, Sandra Brandt and Sharon S. Riley. And that's it. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, can I say something about that? I mean, I, I am in favor of adding both of these people. Okay. But we had a, a fairly, we had a good discussion about who should be represented on this commission. And um, I would hope that we that, that we end any additions to the to the commission because we wanted to have a very select group. These two people fit that that bill. I just would not I mean some people will come forward and volunteer to serve on it. And some people, I mean, good people will, will want to get involved. We had a very select group that, that Breck did a good deal of research on about you know who should and shouldn't be. These people qualify. I would just like to hold that commission at that limit at that number. And I'm a fan of both of those folks. Let me say. I just ask, do we have somebody on? Is somebody on that commission somebody who lives in poverty? I think we had that discussion. We have, I think, a representative, uh, resident of NRHA. I think. Yes. Yes. I can't remember. I think we do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before time is closed, I just want to. I respect your 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 position on the. Uh, uh, the uh, senior tax relief program, uh, but uh, one of the things I, 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 I wish the manager and his staff, his PR people, they, they had an article in the Virginia Pilot uh, that really made the made us look like we uh, are doing something to the detriment, uh, opposed to trying to help. What most people don't understand is that if we hadn't taken those measures, we probably wouldn't have the program. The pro program wouldn't have lasted but so much longer because we couldn't afford the program anymore. And if you understand the, the, the uh, what that 4.7, it, it almost, um, it, 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 the money that we were spending, and you look at the federal money that we had to put aside for the veterans we were mandated to do, I think it was almost like a 4.7 uh, uh, tax increase. Uh, uh, I believe that it was equivalent to that. But I do know this, if we hadn't done anything, uh, we wouldn't be able to serve
the many seniors that were, were, were able to do so because the program was in trouble. And I, and I just wish that we would articulate that when we talk to the media uh, because we had no choice. I mean, you said, well, we, we, uh, we could have left it alone, but the reality, if we had left it alone, uh, we wouldn't have been able to serve as many uh, uh, seniors as we've, been, as we've been serving. And the people who most need the program wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to access the program. And I think we'd have got many more calls. Is it perfect? No. But we have time to go back and look and continue to work on it. But uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, in, doing, in at least getting through this year, we'll at least be able to impact and help uh, more seniors. And we'll get a good gauge on how many people. I think we'll get some people to drop off, but I truly don't want to disenfranchise those individuals who truly need this program, who are living paycheck to paycheck, or I won't say paycheck to paycheck, that have lost a spouse and have limited resources coming into their household who really needs this program. I see them, I talk to them every day, and I have to tell them that, that, you know, it's not the best situation, but at the end of the day, we're trying to help as many people as we possibly can. And we're most, and you look around at the, uh, the uh, other municipalities, I think we have one of the most generous senior tax relief programs uh, uh, in the area. You know, and, and, and that's something we have her talked about. Did you say state? State. Well, in the state, but we need to look at that. that those are, to me, those are important uh, key points that we need to articulate to to the citizens of the city, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what this costs to, to be able to deliver this this, this, this uh, service or uh, this benefit. You know, so. Um. Almost everybody covered um, some of the items I wanted to discuss, but I, I want to reiterate a few things when I agree with Councilman Protegero and Councilwoman Williams about letting our employees have a day off. On, and I understand the mayor has um, uh, an appointments, but maybe you can come and let him in on that day. Sure, you have a key to the city. I'm just going to say <laughs> Especially if other localities are doing it, we, maybe that's something to look at next year's calendar um, when we have a holiday that falls on a Thursday like that. That we just go ahead and build it. That way, you don't have to hear it from us. Because you know Christmas the employees are lobbying us. That's what they, I'll they, check they on do. Christmas for you next week <laughs> from their private emails. <laughs> um, the uh, just real quickly about the senior tax relief. I spoke to a group of senior citizens last week. I was invited to a luncheon, and I. It, there weren't too many complaints about the deferral program itself. It was more about customer service. I have to agree um, with Anthony. Um, quite a few seniors were disappointed that they couldn't actually ever talk to anybody, that every time they called, um, the, the, either the line rang or it was busy. And I don't know if that was just a, how it was set up in service. Um, there were some comments made about employees being kind of rude um, to them, a little bit different than the service that they had received prior to the city taking it over. So they were able to do the compare and contrast type with that. And that's the feedback that we're getting. And with the other part of it, the emotional part of the transition and changes in it, I think that also hyped up some of the sensitivity uh, with some of our seniors. And so we really need to be on this. Even if they're seniors now that are figuring out that they missed the deadline, we need to make sure that we're, you know, talking to them like they're human beings. And I think it was it was kind of hard standing up there as a council person who's not responsible for the administration of this and getting that kind of feedback. And all I could say is I'll bring it up at a council meeting. Um, and there were some individual things I brought to city's attention that was taken care of. Um, just uh, I want to thank Arcos and Public Works. I've sent some individual things. They're doing a great job. Um, I've been hammering them, as I, I said, tis the season this morning to uh, email the Daryl about an issue that came up. I, uh, Our post is for the record. Recreation, Recreation parks and open space. Uh, and uh, yes, we need to um, I drove uh, last week, went on a little family vacation, nine hours to being into New York and drove through many um, towns and cities. And um, when you look at the condition of some of those towns and cities and what they're going through, you really begin to appreciate the work that we do here in Norfolk. I think more of our citizens probably need to get out and see what's going on in some of those towns, um, whether it's median upkeep or code issues, 
Um, I think we work hard in Norfolk. We, we can always do better, we know that, but I, I just appreciate um, our staff and what they do even more, which is why they need July 5th off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because those other jurisdictions have July 5th. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, just uh, somebody went down Pleasant Avenue in East Ocean View and tagged. Um, they went from 21st Street all the way down to 7th Bay. And it, believe it or not, citizens, nobody called it in. And um, then I finally got a person who called me and said, can you do something about it? They tagged stop signs. They tagged private property um, with tons of graffiti. The city went out and took care of their property. Um, I received some feedback from a citizen whose wooden fence had been tagged. And while the city staff was out there um, cleaning up the stop signs, they asked if they could get some assistance with the graffiti because they didn't know how to release it, or get it off the fence. And they, um, the response that came back was a little bit negative. And the citizen was just wondering, you know, it is their property, private property, um, but is there a way that the city could assist with this, especially when it was as much as it was? It wasn't a little, you know, thing on the fence. It was the whole fence. Um, there are still some private boarded up properties that have graffiti on it. And I know that there's a process that you have to contact the property owner. But I just, to keep the area looking clean, if the city's out there doing this, if there's an easier way that they could help, particularly when it was as bad as it was, it wasn't small things. And I'm just wondering if part of neighbors building neighborhoods, if there's a way that we can address that better in the future when we have something like that. Also, the citizens had um, uh, that I just recently talked to had discussed about the cameras that are on Pleasant <coughs> Avenue and why the police haven't looked into using the cameras. The response they got back from one of the police officers was, well, nobody's looking at the cameras and nobody's going to go there and review the footage um, because it, it happened a week ago. You know, we have those cameras up there. Um, I disagreed at the time about putting them up when I was a Civic League member that I thought it was giving false, um, you know, hope to citizens there that would bring safety. If they're there and we're not using them, I, I don't know why we're keeping them up. And I think I've heard some feedback in Denby Park. Um, they have cameras too. And Terry, I don't know if they tell you the same thing. Is anybody looking at them? Why do we have them up? Uh, and then fin finally, the... Um, PPEA, um, I just want to make sure there's some documents that the state has put out uh, about best practices when it comes to this. Have we reviewed those documents? It, it goes a lot further than our own ordinance. Um, our ordinances are, are very specific, but there's some other things in there about um, when you award the contract, making sure that they're friendly to um, the people, contractors that they hire, or things like sure. that. Has that been reviewed? It, it, well, um, many of us that are associated with it have experience with reviewing PPEAs. So the uh, the most important thing, and so thank you for bringing up, um, Councilman Spiegel, you we you do have an ordinance tonight that's a cleanup, right? And I think that there was a message that, that was sent out. But as we discussed last time, this first um, component is just reviewing the PPA to see whether or not we want to receive it. Um, and after that point, you're exactly right. There's so many things that you can do with the PPEA um, that isn't available to us just in the low bid environment. So we'll make sure that we take into account yeah. all the okay. best practices. Right. Yeah. I just want to, you know, sure. if we're reaching that point and for future um, issues, you know, setting precedents, if this sure. were to happen again, just making sure that we've got it all ready to go. Sure. That's it. One more thing, um, Marcus, just in, you know, talking to listen to you and listen to Anthony and um, in some of the task force meetings that we've had, Marcus, we have got to let our staff know that there is no excuse for being rude to citizens. And I say old people with love, there is absolutely no excuse for being rude to old people. Right. There's none. Sure. You know, they do a good job and I love I love our city employees. You know, we go in, we go in the back for them for June, July the fifth. But you know, there is no there is absolutely sure. no excuse sure. because sometimes those people that are out in the field, they're the only that's the only person 
that our citizens may have ever come in contact with the city of Norfolk and they leave with a bad taste in their mouth. And there is no excuse right. for being rude to our citizens and none for being rude to old people. I, I agree with 100%. I, I would hope that um, the feedback the that I received tonight is um, maybe one part of the story or at least anomalies. I can I go to bat for these employees that that's not the way that we work with the residents or the, our neighbors as citizens. So um, I'm hearing these anomalies. Um, there's no excuse there, but I can assure you that that is not the fabric of this this organization. Um, three things here. First of all, uh, in, in fairness to, to those of you who would like to um, close the you know the, the city on Friday following July the 4th, I don't think the manager has the um, power to do that. It needs an ordinance. So um, why don't we get Breck to at least prepare the ordinance, walk it on tonight so we can vote it up or down tonight. I do think there's a difference between what I'm, I'm actually closing my own law firm on, the fifth, on that day. But I, this is public service, and um, sometimes you expect more. I don't remember ever closing City Hall on an extra day except right around the Christmas holidays. I don't know that we've ever closed it any other time, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't on this day necessarily. It, I'm not persuaded that we should, but, I, but there may be five people who want to do it. If you want to do it, we need to vote on it. Uh, and we, we need to do it tonight to give our employees enough notice to know that, you know, they're gonna, they can, they can take off in ten days or something like that. Okay, so we'll just can. I'm gonna get Brett to go draw the ordinance. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, there was some notice in the paper about this, not as much as in the paper as uh, as it was maybe in the daily press, but fact that the region unanimously voted at the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization to declare the third crossing as the preferred alternative for the new crossing or the widened crossing of um, the harbor was a significant uh, step in, uh, the in a direction, uh, in a positive direction for us and for the regional economy and for regional mobility. Um, the environmental impact statement that was um, done, that was, that was uh, performed just recently, the update to the old statement, uh, demonstrated something like 150 acres in Willoughby alone that would be under some form of, of impact, whether it's wetlands or air pollution or noise, or, I mean, but for some reason for years the, the group has just has wanted to widen the bridge tunnel. And uh, they finally saw the logic in creating a new quarter. Um, it will help not only Willoughby and all the people trying to run down the road there, but also in the future, someday, take uh, lots of trucks off Hampton Boulevard, which is very important off to our community as well. And it supports the port and the Navy. So uh, having said that, I want to thank the manager and the staff for all the work they did and trying to persuade their counterparts uh, across the region for uh, to, to persuade their, you know, their folks in their cities to support something like this. Molly Ward from Hampton uh, did a nice job. She chairs the group, and she finally they finally realized in Hampton they did a lot of environmental damage to Hampton. It was like, as she said, doing a Berlin Wall right down the middle. So that's a big step. I, I can't remember a more important uh, transportation decision, road decision, uh, around here in a long time, and hopefully that will last for another 20 years. Um, and then finally, just because, I mean, Paul mentioned that he wanted to go on record about... Uh, um, the, uh, I don't know how you characterize it, it happened, the incident at West Wells Fargo Center, I just want, I need to go on the record too then and say that, that I do believe in the process and, uh, and I do believe that the Commonwealth Attorney, uh, his office will uh, act appropriately and try to reach what they believe is a fair and just <coughs> decision that may take many shapes and many forms, I can't you know, I can't begin to judge what it may be, but I just need to still wanted to say that I do. There's a process, and I believe in it, and I, and I expect it to work. Okay. Um, Mr. Manager. Well, really, sure. Look, this lawsuit, this is, we don't need to do anything, right? 
Uh, no, the, in, the, we um, anticipate being able to handle that summarily. And if it turns out that we do need your participation, we'll contact you. How does today, how does the ruling in the Supreme Court, it seems like the, the ruling in the Supreme Court makes this a non-issue. Um, it, it, it's a, a different aspect of the Voting Rights Act. Okay. Sorry, you got to This is not, this, this was not included. Okay. Council, uh, we have four um, discussions for you, so we're going to try our best to uh, expedite the, uh, the first couple. I know that there's a, a desire to have an action on the uh, chickens discussion from last week. So with the financial policies, I'll just do a quick lead in. Um, we have, um, I think it's very important to first begin by saying that we have strong ratings in the city and bond rating, bond ratings, and we would always like to get those stronger. We've been discussing financial policies um, since at least 2006, and we could go back to 2000 when there was actually a resolution uh, passed by the council that established some of these uh, financial policies. There are sprinkled between that resolution, there's some that are in the budget document that's approved each year. But um, now basically what we're trying to do tonight is take some policies, well, let me say some goals that um, have not been formalized and, and formalize them. But the, what we're also trying to do is make sure they're realistic. What the rating agencies are concerned about is not only that you have these financial policies, but if you, for whatever reason, break through them, um, how do you get back into compliance? So uh, I can recall back when Steve Demick, I believe, stood in front of the council with uh, two, I think, 70-page uh, presentations over time, and uh, financial policies are not something that, I guess, gets people very uh, excited about having a discussion. So um, Sabrina's going to talk a bit about uh, the financial policies. The, um, the, the big deal for us here is to try to make sure that we can weather the storm whenever the storm uh, occurs, and sometimes councilmen when we'll say he's not sure that the storm was ever over. Um, what's uh, extremely important here is that, as Sabrina discusses the financial policies, one of the things that happened between 2000 and 2006 and even today is that no one ever thought that we would have four consecutive years of negative growth or declines in residential real estate. So no matter what the plans were in the past, that is something that we had never experienced before. So that has put us in a, in a very different situation. So in this discussion tonight, it's uh, hopefully realistic po financial policies, policies that will end up with the council voting on a resolution so that when we go to the rating agencies this September, we will have something formalized that we have not had. Thank you. Good evening. Um, back in, I believe it was last September, when we went to the retreat, we gave you this big book which had uh, financial policies in there. And it had about 14 areas that we were going to try and look at and establish policies for. Well, that was a pretty lofty goal. Um, and we looked at it and we said, well, we're still coming out of the recession. There's still stagnant recovery. It's, it's slow. And some of these goals, while we might want to achieve them, it's just not, it's just not possible. Um, so we tailored it down. Back in February, we said we were going to concentrate on maybe three areas, three or four areas. One was our reserves, structurally balanced budget, our debt management policy, and also our parking fund policy, which also leads into our enterprise funds policy. So that's what we're going to talk about, are just those bottom four bullets today. 
And as the manager said, it's not about just having policies. Well, we have policies. You, the former council passed policies back in 2000, but it's what we do with the policies when we break through them or when we don't adhere to them. That's what the credit agencies are looking for, is do we have a financial plan and how are we managing through our stressful times? So one of the focus areas is our structural balance. And we'll cover a little bit of these, and I'll try not to put you to sleep because this, this can be kind of dry stuff. Um, but it is very important, and what we do in terms of establishing a financial policies and good management practices signals to the investor world that we are well managed and they should invest in us and that we do deserve the credit rating that we have. Actually, we probably, we'd like a better credit rating, but we've got a pretty good one right now. So when we looked at um, good financial practices throughout the nation, um, we've highlighted some of them for you in the next couple of slides. We said structural balance, of course, uh, reserve policies, multi-year financial forecasting, prioritize spending plans, a policy regarding non-recurring revenues. And some of these I'm going to get into a little bit more, so I'm going to go pretty fast here. Debt affordability reviews and pay-as-you-go capital funding. Some of the other ones are also how fast do we retire our debt? Do we produce a five-year capital plan? Do we receive financial and budget reporting awards? Um, do we, are we in compliance with GASB standards? That's your governmental accounting standards board. And do we have a well and coordinated economic development strategy. Believe it or not, we actually do. Uh, back in 2000, the council passed a resolution with their economic development strategy. It is quite lengthy, and, and at some point, we're also going to review that and probably bring that back to you for revision. So when we looked at the best practices and said, what do we do well, and what do we need to improve on, and what do the rating agencies put more weight on and more significance on? The fund balance reserve policies is a very significant indicator of our financial health. Do we do it? So there are three columns there. Left side indicates the practice. The middle column indicates the value that the rating agencies place or investors place. And Norfolk's current practice. So we have check marks and exclamation points in the third column. <coughs> check marks mean that we do do it, but we need to strengthen them. We do some of it, but we can, we can strengthen those areas. The exclamation marks actually mean that we do them quite well. We're, we're okay. So fund balance reserve policies, again, we have some, but we need to strengthen them, and we need to establish a framework of what we do when we blow through them. Debt affordability reviews and policies, again, we have them. We, same thing, we need to strengthen them. Debt disclosure practices, we're pretty, we're pretty well off in that. We, we disclose everything. Um, Multi-year financial forecasting. We come to you every January and give you a five-year financial plan, and that's when you see the budget gaps growing each year. Um, that's our mid-year financial forecasting. We do regular financial reporting, but can we do it better? Absolutely, we can. Pay-as-you-go capital funding, that's how much cash do we put towards our capital projects. We used to put a lot more in, but with the recession, we have not been able to put as much as we'd like to put in, and so our debt goes up when we don't put in as much cash. And that's one of the areas we need to concentrate on. De rapid debt requirement, uh, retirement, how fast do we retire our 20 and 30 year debt? Uh, the standard is, I mean, the gold standard is about 65% that we should be retiring. We used to be about 64% in 2008. We are now, I think, we're less. It's projected to go, go less because what we have tried to do is manage through this time period when our debt service has gone up and the larger projects are going through our system. So we're not retiring it as quickly as we'd like to. Sabrina, when you put the check marks mm -hmm. there, those are the things that we need to work on. Right. Is there any or are you going to get to how those areas that we need to work on, how we compare with other cities? Um, in some cases, yes. Okay. Yes. If not, we will always get you that answer. Okay. Um, Non-recurring revenues, that's about our structural balance again, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Five-year capital planning, that's that CIP section we give you every April, March, April in, our, in the budget presentation. And financial and budget reporting awards. You know, geeks like us like to get these awards. It doesn't mean much to anybody else, but it means something to the investors. That tells people that we are disclosing our practices. Our CAFR gets the Excellence Award in, from the Government Finance Officers Association. The Budget Document gets the Outstanding Distinguished Award. Those are the highest in each of the categories that we do get. Um, and actually, they told me not to say this, but I'm going to tell you. I went to a finance conference 
a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sitting there in San Francisco looking at the screen on the budget document, and there comes on the screen is a, a, an example of a page from our budget document for all the people to see, and it had City of Norfolk up there as an example of a best practice. We had two pages in that presentation. So, like I said, geeks like us like those kinds of things. Nine I'm sorry? Like I did. <laughs> Nine geeks like it, too. I actually texted the, the staff back and said, look at what you all did. Lori, do you have a symbol you can put up? <laughs> <laughs> so how do we compare with our ratings, our uh, general obligation ratings? How does our three credit rating agencies look at us? Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. We're pretty... We're classified as a highly uh, rated issuer. In, um, we're, for Moody's, we're strong, S&P, we're high, and Fitch, we're high. We are two notches away from AAA in Moody's and Fitch, and we're one notch away in, I'm sorry, Moody's and S&P, and one notch away from Fitch. On the right-hand side, you have um, the comparisons of our local cities, and there are two cities. Virginia Beach is AAA in all three categories, City of Chesapeake, is AAA for Fitch, and we're pretty comparable for the rest of our cities. We rank a little bit higher in some cases, and I think we're the highest. Um, rating agencies also look at some other things as we go through our review when we go for um, issuance. They have all three, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch have talked about our reserves, our policy on reserves. That's something that they are looking at. Our return to structural balance, our compliance with our debt policies, the increase in our debt burden, and how are we managing our budgetary pressures as we move through this recession. They're also looking at our exposure to the federal funding and our income levels through in relation to the rest of the nation. So those are things that they have commented on, and they are looking at us for that. So, Sabrina, mm -hmm. the three rating agencies would be the equivalent to the three credit bureaus in where they collect their own information, they evaluate their own information, and they don't share. They just publish their... They do share. We, we have a very good share. relationship with okay. them. Yes. Okay. So moving on to the focus areas, um, the structural balance. And you've seen this. This was part of the city manager's message. As a, we will always present to you a balanced budget. Whether or not it's structurally balanced is another issue. The last few years, we have not been able to present to you a structurally balanced budget, and that's because we've had to make some tough choices. Is do we use our one-time revenues and cut expenditures to the level where we have to lay off 200 people? Um, again, back at that same finance conference, I listened to some of the localities and some of the draconian measures that they took. There are localities out there that have actually rolled back salaries. They have increased their real estate tax rates. They have furloughed employees. They have closed pools. They have closed libraries. And some of them still have not opened them back up. Um, we have not, we've done some of that, but we have not rolled back salaries. We haven't furloughed anyone. It is, it's, it's tough. It's tough to make those decisions. And I think what we have done in the past, at least three years since I've been back, is said, laying off people doesn't help anyone. It just hurts our economy even more because then you're lowering the purchasing power. So how do we keep our folks employed, but at the same time raise our revenue? So again, not structurally balanced means that we are using our one-time revenues to support ongoing expenses such as salaries. And this is our five-year forecast. As you, as you see, it last um, this was presented to you February 2013. We are looking at a budget gap. Again, we will come to you and we will close that gap but it may not be structurally balanced. Um, it, it just, it, we have a bad period coming up in 2015 and 16, so we just need to manage through this. We're not out of the woods yet. So how do we achieve a structurally balanced budget? We think that we can do it within five years, but it's gonna take some restraint on our spending. It's gonna take some discretion on our part. We can do it through revenue growth. Um, we can do it through expenditure reductions. We increase efficiencies and we grow our, grow our economy. So reduce, one of the things that we need to do is reduce our reliance on the one-time revenues for ongoing expenditures. And that means it's a corresponding, we have to lower our expenditures at the same time. So what do we cut? Where do we look for efficiencies? And the budget that we presented to you before it ever got into your hands this past March, we'd already taken 15 million out of it through reductions. So. Our executive departments, the departments in the past three years, um, and I told Marcus, 
this all the time, that we manage it, but we don't tell people how we manage it a lot of times. We just absorb it. And we've managed to cut our departments, our executive departments, over the past three years. We've done media reductions and also continuing reductions going into the upcoming years. So, yes, sir. Spring, uh, we have an operating budget. I put about 812, 815. 817. 817. How much of that was out of was in one his one time funds this year? Um, we're looking at about at least nine point one million. Okay. That's out of an eight, out of an eight hundred and seventeen million dollar budget, that equates to what? A one, one a little over one percent. Okay, that was the point. My point. I mean, I don't know how many communities in in this econ worldwide global economy downturn are. I mean, I agree with what you're saying. But I don't want the word to go out that somehow that that this I mean, that we're so that we're really out of balance. We're like one percent out of balance, almost right. a little more than one percent. Right. The objective and that's, is to that's a manageable figure. It's the objective is to eventually achieve a structural balance. Yeah. That way, we know that we can continue and, our services. You, you mentioned the capital piece. Our goal has always been, I think, the cash fund about ten percent of our capital budget. And where were we this year? Um, it's a little skewed because we have Camp Allen coming in. So while well, that's not our money. Okay, and some of it was skewed with the Slover piece and all that. Right. right. But you're still able for accounting purposes to use that money. Correct. Yes. That's sir. in the okay. Yeah. I just going forward it's it's about six hundred thousand dollars that's ongoing cash contribution to the CIP. Um so our policy focus areas. What we're saying in this is we achieve our structural balance. And again, we, shouldn't, we should try not to use our surpluses to achieve structural balance. We'll never get there if we use our surpluses. In the past two or three years, we have forced surpluses. Um, we've asked our departments to curtail their spending towards the end so because we knew we were going to have problems in the upcoming year and we needed the money to carry forward. So as we move through our funding plan priorities, what we're saying is as we achieve a surplus, our first order of business is to put money towards our capital projects, put more cash into the CIP, or fund our reserves. And let me get to that a little bit. What we have done with our reserve policies, again, we said that we were going to try and make them achievable. We don't want any unrealistic demands out there because then when we don't meet them, the rating agencies will, will look at that. So our reserves, as we've established this in the, in the far right-hand column, our unassigned general fund reserve policy is 5%. What we've done is we're saying we're going to establish floors and caps, um, minimums and maximums. The minimum for the 5% reserve, uh, unassigned general fund balance, we're saying it should be 5%. That's your minimum. Most localities go from anywhere from 7 to 15%. That's our bare minimum. We're there. We've met our floor. With the risk management reserve, we're saying our floor should be 3 million. Again, we're there. We're already at our minimum. So right now, we don't need to put money into either one of those two funds. Our economic downtown reserve, we're saying our floor should be $3 million. We're there. So at this current juncture, we do not need to put money into our reserves as long as we establish that minimum base. Now, when we move further, we say our, as I said, the risk management is $3 million. Economic is $3 million. We say our cap should be about $5 million. The risk management, what we've done is we looked at our three years past history of average claims, plus what we do in unemployment, un workers' compensation, and we said an additional two million would help. So our cap for that would be five million. The economic downturn, we looked at the past three years of real estate revenue, and that's about 2.5, which equates to about another $2 million for the economic downturn. And we're not establishing a cap for the unassigned general fund reserve. Again, we are at the, at the minimum for all of these. So if, going back to this, if we generate a surplus in this upcoming year, we can put money towards capital. And we can, if we so choose, we can put money towards the reserves. Sure. OK, could you just go back two slides? Which reserves, way? The, your pots, your three, your, um, okay, beforehand, the five percent, the economic downturn uh, policy, which was never adopted, was $10 million. So when Sabrina said earlier, 
we would have policies that are realistic. We, we just don't believe it's realistic to have a policy that we put in front of you to adopt to have a $10 million economic downturn goal. Um, we also, the risk management was something like $11.4, $11.6 million. Again, we don't think that was realistic. I think that's why we struggled for years getting these adopted. So right now, what Sabrina said, for all three of these pods, you have met your minimum. And she's adding for two of the three a, a maximum, if you will, that based on surpluses, you could add to it. So some of the things that caused us to um, push away from this years ago are addressed in those last three slides. Uh, Marcus, on the, uh, the risk management, is that self-insurance? Is that part of that aspect or self-insurance something different? We, we will have, it's, it's over and above what we already have set aside. I believe we have set aside in two different pots close to $7 million. So this would be over and above what you have to pay, to pay out claims and, and property. So you already have seven million. Yes, sir. And so this would be three million above that. Yes, sir. Okay. So well, and part so of that is on, um, workers' compensation. Okay. Now, um, will a couple of uh, serious events that we have found liable for what would that do to us? It would be difficult. I think the biggest claim that we've had in the last decade is like seven, seven and a half million dollars. So assume that the seven or so million dollars that we have already set aside for claims that we spend it each year. So the first place that you would go beyond that would be this risk management pot in which you have three million and we're saying you would cap it out at five. So that would be the place to go, Mr. Councilor Riddick. But you know, it's your response. We come to you and we start. Mm -hmm. We sit at the table and all of a sudden money's being pushed around for political purposes. Both of you have to put your foot down and tell us you know, this is going to affect us one way or another. I mean, just don't make us feel good mm -hmm. when we're sitting here trying to, you know, as we're doing the budget time here. I mean, they got to tell, you got to tell us. Because you know, for politics, you know, we want to make our, make everybody happy. And at some point, you got to draw us back right. and, and realistically and tell us right. this is not going to work. We can't do this. We can't do that. Or this will you know, make certain effects. Uh, I mean, it really is incumbent on you to do that. And, I, you know, this is, and you've done a great job with this uh, what, what, presentation. Have we abated the economic downturn fund? Before, yes. And you, put, and you have put money back into it. At one and point, as high as it was four million. I don't see how we can. Did we do it last year? No, 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 sir. You, you Regina put, did it. Actually. Yeah. The what? No, you did it. City manager. You did it. You you did. Did. We didn't take money out. Of it. Oh, take money out. No, but putting it back, you did. I mean, that's what it was there for. I mean, we were in the teeth of this. Though. Right, but we've. That's never, when we were, you know, closing library hours and stuff. Oh, um, one thing that we we haven't we haven't heard to. Uh, touched on it, you might be getting it towards the end, is our retirement fund. Uh, how we're funded there now. If, it's my understanding that we're not fully funded as far as our retirement fund is concerned. Or am I no, we're, we're, confused? No, sir. We're, we're not at 100%. We're a little bit, um, as the last numbers that came out last year, we're a little bit north of 80%. Mm -hmm. But from a rating agency perspective, being north of 80% is, for lack of a better word, being in the ball game. Mm -hmm. So, no, we're not at 100%. We're a little north of 80 as of last year's uh, numbers. Okay. Okay. I know when the retirement board uh, came in, they think that we should be a little stronger than the 80%. Last, last year, when Portsmouth was doing their budget, they, they, uh, they issued bonds to fully fund their retirement. Uh, fund, which a couple of people around this table thought was a bad idea, and I don't have an opinion on it. But uh, I think that's something that we should be cognizant of, the fact that, you know, we're not really funded. And anything we can do to kind of close that gap would be great. I know the manager has made a commitment to the retirement board that we will fund their request. That's the first guy. Yeah. I think he took some money from somewhere. Right. Yeah. I remember that well. So... In order to do any of this, we have to generate a surplus. 
but we're also saying the surplus has to be at least 1% of the general fund budget. So for example, in 2014, our budget's 817, but let's just round. $800 million budget, 1% of that would be 8 million. So if we generate an $8 million surplus this year, half of that can be used for funding our pay-as-you-go capital or our reserves. But we're gonna cap that at 2 million. We can only use 2 million of that half. And again, we're doing this because we're, we still know that we're coming out of the recession. We're still not where we want to be. So part of this is also to come back to you every two to three years and say, okay, where are we financially? Let's change our parameters. Let's change our surplus parameters on how we deposit money into reserves. Or do we need to increase our reserve amounts? Again, we want to make sure that we can achieve these. We don't want to put goals out there that we can't get to. Um, and any time we draw money from here, from these funds, we will always come back to you. We will need council authorization. And when and if we ever ask you to draw money from here, the city manager will be obligated to submit a plan to you for replenishment within three years. So those are the things that the rating agencies will look for is some sort of plan of action. And there is in your um, presentation, there is an appendix area that details that whole section out. So let's talk about debt management policies for a little bit. We've had long-standing debt management policies in our budget document. So we're going to get, well, is, there, is there an agenda item here that's pressing that we should get to? Yes, the, here's can the... Can we uh, break wow. this into to another segment for next week? Sure, so. sure we can. The main thing for us is when we go to um, borrow money, um, go before the rating agencies at the beginning of September, we made a commitment to them that we would have financial policy. So Sabrina has shared with you probably 80% of them. And the, All right, we can do this next week. I just, I mean, I, we've got sure. some people here apparently came to sure. maybe listen to another presentation. I just want to sure. make sure we get... No, no, we can. The goal is to get a resolution passed sometime in July. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We are going to go to the market. So let's tee this debt, the debt management piece of this up for next, for two. Sure. Sure. Okay. okay. And then we can all ask our questions then if we have... Comments? She said she'll postpone appointments. Mr. Mayor, is just the, seemed like a logical point sure. to bring up. Okay. Um, for the remaining time, are we doing senior disabled tax relief or chickens? What, what's the what's the How much of the history we need of chickens? Can we just go to the proposal? Sure. Yeah. Sure. With the options. The sure. Okay. That's fine. Then. Okay. So with that said, uh, the, the quick the quick queue up is the last time we talked about uh, chickens. Uh, we left you with the health department administering the program and having a minimum of one acre. Um, Ron has been working with the planning department as well as with the health department, and we have. Uh, a couple of options for you that are less so than a, an acre. So since that time in, uh, in January, the health department has uh, promulgated regulations and are prepared to issue permits. Really what we left you with in the last discussion uh, that you were talking about was the size of the lot that we would permit this. And so that's what's before us. What we had was a, yeah, what we had was, a, was an acre. And that, that's about 100 to 150 parcels. Um, general consensus around the table, if we recall, was that, uh, well, that's, that's not enough. So the next option would be 20,000 square feet, which is approximately a half acre. That would be about 975 parcels. If we were to do that, we would recommend that uh, six hens uh, be the maximum. The next option would be 10,000 square feet, which is the quarter acre. And that was your last discussion, basically, is a half acre, quarter acre, which would give you approximately 8,400 parcels that are identified here. And we would recommend that be a maximum of four hens on the parcel. Yeah. All right. So the question is, do you I mean op option? What was the first option? Option one is uh, basically. Okay. Are you know, asking for our feedback tonight on whether to do option one or option yes. two? We're prepared to bring an ordinance. When? On July 11th. Can we call the brand? Well, looking at option two, um, you can see where most of the red is. That was really good. I, um, 
Barkley and I will get most of the calls <laughs> for well, your complaint. Get, I really, I mean, Portsmouth, I Portsmouth just passed. I, Terry and I have been gigging the city about this because Portsmouth's public health director and planning director said opposite of ours recommend recommendations. So, uh, yeah, and they, they passed the theirs. Sitting behind you, you've got to. They pass. They pass. They pass. And I, I'm really curious they, about the science between four hens in ten and six hens in twenty. I'm looking at New York City. They have no limits on the amount of chickens. None. And they have had no complaints. I, I'm really curious about this because we don't limit dogs, which produce so much more noise, so much more waste. I think we I, do. We limit it to four. It's just four. It's a limit on dogs. Well, we don't limit it to the uh, size of their lots. No. And we don't limit it to a proximity to water. There, there are lots of citizens in Norfolk who are anxious and excited about option two and getting it out there and are willing to go and help and educate the public about actually why this is a good thing. In fact, there's some sitting here today that came down because they thought we were voting on it today. Um, I've tried to respond back to as many as I could and told them we're not voting on it today, but we're considering it. And I think this was a good compromise when we discussed this um, last time that we're not opening up to the whole city, but to those lots that would, you know, generally it wouldn't disturb their neighbors if that was an issue. Um, they had more of the land size to allow them to be able to have it. Well, let me say, I don't live in New York City, and I don't, I don't know what they do up there. I just um, told you. you know, I, I don't, okay. <laughs> what part of that well, thing is here? <laughs> well, uh, okay. I'm not sure I believe that they don't have any problems with chickens in, in New York City. But uh, I've always been of the opinion that if you're going to try something new, you ought to be careful about the way you do it. And that's why, I mean, I would support option one. And if we we can come back and visit it in a year, if we're not having a lot of problems, then we can go to, that's just me. So I would support option one. Yeah, and maybe we can go around, and that's the half acre site, right? If, 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 uh, if a community has a homeowners association, does this ordinance supersede uh, any docks uh, that um, have been in place previous? How would that work, Bernard? That, that if you had something like the uh, planned East Beach where there you have restrictions, those restrictions would govern over what our uh, ordinance would allow, but they would have the option if they wanted to to change them. But, but in, in a conflict between a, a restriction on a planned community, the restriction will govern. Okay. Okay, this, do, do you want to go around the table and just forecast so they can bring us an ordinance? And, I, I can somebody just I, tell I, me I, I how big is 20,000? Show the map for that. The number of parcels? Could you show the map? Yeah. So there's absolutely nothing on absolutely. the enlargement. <laughs> right. The option two is <laughs> brought it up. The setbacks would remain the same. Basically, it's a criteria that we've established in the requirements. No, no roosters. Can't sell eggs. It's all sustainable. But you can give them away. You can give them away, yes. We're saving cartons in our house. Sustainable. Are, are there five votes for any one of these options? I'm option two. Okay, we got one. Paul, are you? It's quarter. I'm, a, I'm against it, but I'll vote for option one. Okay. I'm against chickens. Two. Three. <laughs> one. Two, three, two, two. I don't know. I think option number one. Okay. Option two. All right, so anybody keep score. Four, 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 four. four, four, four. four. Bring them both and see what happens. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm sure we can do some horse trading on that day. I, I agree. I think we are really making, spending more time and energy on this than I don't when it was driving. How did it get here? Because we brought it up because we've had citizens that have come to us. And that was back when we used to have committees. I don't know that I have a real conception of, of a quarter of an acre. I don't know what I, if I have a conception of a quarter of an acre and a half. Acre. I know, but still, I, I need to see it. I'll, I'll find it between those two. 100 by 200 means nothing to me. I'll, I'll find it, I'll look at it. And I, I'll find it and I'll look at it this week. I'll find a half an acre and I'll find it. Angela, make it large ones. Large ones. Okay, those are 50 by 100 or what is it? So those are not 
Not Most of your standard lot sizes in Norfolk are 50 yeah. by 100, and, you know and that would eliminate almost would, the whole city. I would suggest we bring it up, it up or down because we stopped on the, the mm. bond rating as well as the senior tax relief to talk about chickens running around in the backyard. Okay. So let's bring it up and let's get it done. Okay. But we've asked for okay. this presentation I understand. I understand. a year and a half ago is when this first okay. came up. Portsmouth okay. did it in two right. months. I can take option two. You want to go option two? I got five for option two. Let's go. Okay. Right. Option two it is. Thanks very much. No <laughs> lobbying. No <laughs> lobbying behind the scenes. There, right. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> didn't have to lay five on that one. <laughs> you didn't get a field house either. <laughs> <laughs> got my field house. You, you, you already had your field house. <laughs> How is this going to be regulated? The permits would be issued by the health department. Uh, Dr. Lindsay's it here. It came with bird, bunnies, and bees, Paul. So the That's inspections we got it. We got and the, bird, the issuance of the permit. Um, but we got the bunnies and the bees. The only thing that was left was the bird. At least by next week, could you tell us if there are going to be any cost associated with this? And how you would. We're done. I mean, what the process would be. Sure. Okay. I mean, you have code officials who are going to go out there. That's right. Four hands. I mean, yeah. It'd be the same. I mean, it's going to be. It'd be the same that they regulate people same with dogs. Same as they're doing with dogs. We don't have enough do. people to do that. And they, and they, they, don't, they, they don't have enough to do. They got enough to do. That's a little different. That's why we're giving them off. People do are not going to treat chickens the way they treat their dogs. That's true. No, they're going to treat them better. Exactly. They're going to keep the chickens asking, outside. You know, People keep the dogs questions. inside. I mean, you shouldn't belittle them. The chickens will be yeah, there. Yeah, no, we, but we can laugh at the chickens. But I think there are some legitimate questions. First, I would say you have laughed at it. And secondly, you've allowed uh, government officials to come in and do that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And secondly, you've allowed um, conjecture to make decisions. And you need to be thinking about common sense rules and why other cities have recognized that this can right, be done okay. safely. Right, now you're preaching. But, but, but also, you're, so, you're telling me. Well, you're asking no, questions. Is but Anthony, also, <laughs> Anthony, Anthony, yeah. Anthony, okay. there are two council members who have done enough homework on this. Okay. 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 I, I respect okay. that. I respect okay. that. Okay. Okay. But I'm saying, saying she yeah. can't yeah. say that this is the yeah. same yeah. thing yeah. as yeah. the All right, okay. This is done. It's just for eggs.